Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jennifer Morton, your host for this exciting event. Before we dive into today's webinar, I'd love to hear from all of you. In the chat, please share a challenge or mistake you have faced while managing inventory in the past. This will help us understand your experiences better and make our upcoming presentation even more valuable. So if you have a chance, go ahead and start using the chat now. Jennifer, I was just going to say we have some interactive points to this presentation, okay. so I can really use. We love collaboration and any feedback responses in the chat, really helpful. And we're going to need you for some of the presentation to jump in. Perfect. Penny did jump in and she says, too much old inventory that gets left behind and we end up with first in still here. Managing an appropriate level of shoe inventory. This is Kristen. Ah, we're starting to get some responses now. Challenging to accommodate all the sizes and individual preferences for style and function. Amy says a challenge for us previously was our old presidents did not want us to have a sales rack or table to help move old clothing from past years. We have a new president, so hopefully that can change. Amy, I agree. Hopefully that can change. Cindy saying too much inventory at the end of the season. I bet that's something that you hear a lot of. Dane. And Dina is saying, one of my biggest problems is understanding where my shrinkage comes from. I know there's shrinkage, but finding the answers and the right report to run is a challenge. Then we have Caroline, who is a new intern, but she's noticed the amount of extra inventory. So it seems like this is an ongoing issue. Hi, everyone. I'm Dane Cohen, and I'm with Management One. We are the largest provider of inventory planning for independent retailers across North America. As you can imagine, we are dealing with inventory issues like the challenges you were describing in the chat each and every single day with our over 1,000 retailers, again, across North America. And essentially what we're trying to accomplish is really help build roadmaps for retailers when it comes to their purchasing decisions around merchandise to ensure profitability and the key word here, well, two words, cash flow. Cash is king. And so what we're going to kind of dive into today, and just to give you a little bit of my background, I started my career in the wholesale side of the business. So spent a lot of years in kind of the corporate world, managing the sales for a large men's wholesale distribution. And then kind of my, my crowd, my pride and joy was that I had the opportunity to work as the director of retailer and the general merchandise manager for an independent chain of family stores that was doing 45 million in business annually with seven locations. As you can imagine, that's a lot of moving parts, a lot of inventory to keep track of. And that's how I found Management One. And hopefully this is one of the big takeaways and Jennifer and I were discussing this beforehand. We work with retailers from pet stores. We work with fashion retailers. We work with college bookstores, regular bookstores. We're really across any, any retailer who is buying merchandise ahead of season and needs to sell down on it because of the seasonality of the goods we are working with. So. There are, of course, in every industry, especially golf, there are going to be nuances and things that make your business new, unique. So I hope that from this presentation, we're highlighting some of the things that we're noticing across the verticals we work with. Some things that will apply to your business. There are some things that maybe won't, but I hope that you take some of the inspiration points we're talking about and really, and we can discuss at the end, find is that you can incorporate some of these philosophies, mentalities into your own business. So with that, just one piece of housekeeping. Here is the QR code. You can scan this and we'll also come back at the end. Uh, you could scan this and we will send you over a copy of this presentation. I know Jennifer is going to send it out to the email list as well. So you'll have multiple ways of grabbing this presentation. But we're trying to keep up with the times and here's an easy QR code just to grab it with. But also my colleague, Nico Cabral is in the chat as well. 
and he'll throw a link. In. So you'll have multiple ways to get this presentation just in case you want to take notes or you will be able to deliver it to you so you can focus and stay present with me for the next 30, 45 minutes. All right, we are talking about critical mistakes to avoid when managing your inventory. And usually we try to take our kind of educational in the positive direction. And we switched it up this year to highlight some of the traps that retailers may fall into season after season. And I, and, and certainly, especially when I was buying it in my buying days, I certainly fell into a lot of these critical mistakes. And I think one of the big things is realizing when they're one of the first issues with dealing with the problem with business is realizing perhaps there is a problem. So I'm going to show you a video now that went viral two years ago. It went viral across TikTok and Instagram and check it out. Okay. Okay, so you may be thinking, why is this guy showing me a video of someone shoplifting in a Walgreens from 2020? This video racked up over 5 million views across the internet. And that coupled with, I'm sure a lot of you couldn't escape the headlines in retail across 2020, 2021 about the shoplifting crisis that had hit stores. Okay, this was dominating the news cycle when it came to retail. And here's why I'm showing you this video. Walgreens, which is obviously a major retailer in the American market, made some pretty big decisions. And they credit this video to being one of their tipping points. They decided to crop to close more than five stores in the San Francisco area due to shoplifting. They, across the nation, surged their staffing in security. So a lot of times you'll walk into a Walgreens, you'll see someone standing at the front entrance. That costs a lot of money, that added security presence. And then the bane of all our existence, they start to lock down their merchandise behind cabinets. And it used to be specific items, but then it started growing to your toothbrushes and your toothpaste were locked behind cabinets and you have to ring the button and bring someone over. And all in all, this was a major initiative of Walgreens based on the headlines and all the data they were receiving about the shrinkage issues and the shoplifting issues that were happening around this time. So now, why is this so interesting to us at Management One? Just two months ago, on an earnings call, the CFO, and I quote, in the earnings call said, maybe we cried too much over shoplifting. This is the CFO of one of the largest retail institutions saying, maybe we cried a little too much over shoplifting. In fact, their shrinkage numbers from 2021, when they started to make these decisions, had already started naturally dropping to a point where it evened out in 2022 to what their average had been pre-pandemic, that 2.5%. So here is the lesson that we learned here. Walgreens, who closed stores, increased security staffing at a huge expense, locked merchandise displays so that customers got frustrated and were upset, they lost millions of dollars in revenue over this decision. And more importantly, they lost brand trust in the areas they closed, and they frustrated a heck of a lot of customers who now couldn't have access to merchandise without waiting 20 minutes. So how did this happen? How did an organization with such access to big data, 
and tons of reporting and tons of staff make a decision that ultimately lost the millions when the problem was already solving itself. What happened here was confirmation bias. All of those headlines, all of the viral videos, all of the news, their data that they were getting just confirmed a narrative that they already believed. And the decision that they made that they cried too much over was a decision that cost the company millions of dollars and really was a data decision that was made on biased decision making. And so this is going to be the framework for this presentation. What are the cognitive biases that we all bring to the table when we're analyzing our data? And listen, inventory management is a data game. One of the things I hear from retailers all the time is, I'm a product person, numbers aren't my thing. Key to successful retail is accurate and informed analytics of your data. That is where the cash can be found in your business. So again, when we talk today, we're going to talk about the maybe areas that we're making some critical mistakes surrounding when it comes to our data and what biases that we bring to the table may be standing in our way of making the best decisions possible for our retail businesses. So let's talk about the first critical mistake. Stop thinking you can't increase your initial markup. And initial markup, your IMU, is really the foundation where all of this begins from a profit planning perspective, right? It is essentially, you are setting the ceiling of how much profit you can make in your business, right? Because as we know in retail, the price is only going to come down. If you price something at $60, that is the most you will ever get for that item. It's not going up in price. It will only come down from there. Promotions through markdowns, for it may be. And so the IMU that you said is really setting yourself up for success or failure. And the most important thing is that the margin that's built into that initial markup is going to cover the expenses of your business. And so one of the things that we hear a lot is, there's nothing I can do about my markup. My vendor set the price. You know what? I just double it. I do a keystone markup. I can't think about it other than that. I'm just doubling the cost and that's how I price my goods. Or I just have a formula where I double the price and then add a dollar or two. The idea that we can start to increase our profitability of our business through your initial markup is a bias that we need to overcome. And here's what's so interesting about initial markup. If there was ever, ever a time in the history of retail where increasing prices and analyzing your prices and looking for a different pricing strategy, it is during the middle of one of the biggest inflationary periods in American history, right? Prices are going up everywhere. You can't get a hamburger for less than $12 anymore, right? We are all accustomed to see price increases. If you don't take the opportunity now to start looking at the areas of your business where you can start increasing your pricing to your customers, you're missing out on a very crucial business because while your expenses are rising and your cost of doing business are rising, so too must your pricing. And so here's where I need a little bit of audience participation. And I don't know if we can go off mute or but I want to do a little experiment with everyone to showcase some of the biases we bring to the table when we're pricing our goods. Let's take this great polo here, okay? It's a nice polo shirt, navy, probably going to be a nice seller for us. The wholesale cost, when you go to your vendor, the wholesale cost is $25. Can someone tell me what they would price this at their retail store? 
I go to your shop, I'm looking at the shelf, what am I seeing this on the racks for? You could write an answer in your chat. Okay, let's see. $50, $52, $60, $69, $59, $70, going once, going twice, any worse, $69.99. Lisa, I like that. $70. Okay, great. So we really see a range from fifty to seventy dollars. I'm assuming for anyone who priced it at fifty, we're doing a nice keystone markup. We're doubling that wholesale cost, and we are passing that along to the customer. Oh, fifty dollars plus embroidery. Smart, very nuanced. I like that answer, Amy. So now I'm. We're going to do a different experiment. Okay, let's take this big screen TV. Okay, great TV. It is 60 inches wide. It's a brand new model, 2023 brand new model. It has quantum LED. I have no idea what quantum LED is, but it has it. It has Dolby Vision. That sounds great. 4K HD. You got to have 4K HD now. It's a smart TV. It has Hulu and Netflix and all that good stuff. Can someone tell me? what they might expect the retail price if you were walking into a store of this item to be. $200. That's a great deal, Lauren. Sixty $659.99. $12.99. $1,500. $750. $489. Any other takers? $700. Now, the price of this TV across retail stores in America right now ranges from $399 to $1,299. And now, listen, this is just a little bit of the thought experiment, but the purpose of this exercise is to show you the bias that we bring when we are looking at our pricing. This is a bias known as anchoring bias. You use the last piece of data in order to make your decision. So when I describe a product and all its features, you price it based on what you think the value is, right? And that value range from $400 to people pricing up to $1,500. That's a huge gap. The minute that I give you the wholesale price, you have something to anchor your decision to. You've already said that wholesale price is 25. That's easy. I'm pricing at 50. But we don't stop to think, what would the customer actually pay for this item? And I love that someone put in the embroidery fee there because you have an opportunity. You're selling goods that are customized for your customer, right? They're coming to you and they want your logo, your insignia. The, they are paying for that in the price of the goods as well. So my question to you is when we're thinking about pricing, it's so easy just to think, what's the wholesale cost? Let's anchor my decision to that and I'm going to set a price for it instead of what is my customer really willing to pay? And so we want to steer clear of cost-based pricing. And one of the reasons that this is so important is because it's not about the big wins always, right? This is not about, hey, if I'm going to price something at $52, why can't I price it at $100? No. This is, if my customer is willing to pay $52 for this, do I think they're willing to pay $59? Can I get some more margin out of this item and start building my initial markup across my store so that my profit margins are rising and they're protected and they're inflating, quite frankly, in line with what's happening in the overall economy. So steering clear of cost-based pricing is something that is Super important and mistake that a lot of us fall into. I am so guilty of this so many times over. Because let's face it, it's easier to do cost-based pricing. So I want everyone to think about 
I am you. And we're going to do a little bit of retail math here. So some formulas going on, which we're happy in another session or offline to talk through how you would actually set your I am you. But again, I really encourage, and this is the first thing we do with our retailers, is your I am you actually setting you up for success, right? Is that margin that you are building into the sauce, is it actually enough to cover your expenses and operating costs? Because if it's not, you are starting the race behind. So setting your IMU target has three key elements. The first is, what are my expected markdowns in a year? Right? We all can look at our business and say, on average, we can expect that 15%, 20% of our sales are going to come from markdown-driven sales. So that is the first key element. If we're looking to set our IMU in the next 12 months, what do we expect our markdown rate to be based on what we've historically done or what we're going to do? The second part is, what's my operating expenses, right? As a, as a rule of thumb, is it 40% of my sales go to my operating cost? We all can calculate that number that has to be factored into your IMU because obviously this is all necessary to cover those expenses. Your IMU needs to cover your expenses. And then finally, after my expenses are covered and my markdowns are taken into account, what's my desired net profit? What do I actually want my goal to be? And goal setting is something that is so important to retail establishments, right? If we are just walking into a buying season without any goals around our top line sales, our uh, initial markup, our maintained markup, what margins we want to end the season at, how much markdowns we want to take, and ultimately what our desired net profit is, then how are we getting some point A to point B? So these three key elements are what will establish our IMU target. And again, it's a target. So we want to make sure that our, most of our goods are falling in line with the target where we can build on that, we're called our margin builders, right? Where we can start squeaking up the price and where we can't, right? They're called loss leaders, right? So the areas that we have to have this item, it's below our target IMU, but it brings people into the shop. It gets people excited. It's a big seller. That's a loss leader. So you're going to have your loss leaders. You're going to have your target IMU products. And then you're going to have your margin builders where you can start padding some extra dollars on top of that. And let's see what this looks like. And again, I go back to the example because this is the first piece of feedback I get from every retailer after I do this presentation. So I'm going to stop it right before it even comes up. I'm going to nip it in the butt. I can't. What do you want me to just raise my prices across the board? Maybe, right? Maybe we're not talking about huge increases. Can you add 99 cents onto the price of your goods? Can you add 99 cents? And let's look at what that looks like in a million dollar retailer, what that 99 cent looks like. So we have a retailer that's doing, that set their IMU, that have their IMU set at 52 and a half percent, okay? We did the calculations and their IMU should really be sitting at 55%. That's their sweet spot. That's what's gonna cover their expenses, factor in their markdowns and get them to the desired net profit that they want. That 2.5% increase in initial markup when you look at a $9 item at cost, it only accounts for 99 cents at retail, 99 cents. So let's look at that across a million dollar business. We have an annual business of a million dollars, markdowns at around 20%. The difference in maintained markup from that 99 cents, that Going from a 52 and a half IMU to a 55%, that is all bottom line dollars. Any price that you increase on your initial markup goes straight to your bottom line. And this retailer, by making that change from 52.5 to 55% and setting that target, was able to add 30K, 
$30,000 in net profit to their bottom line. That's the difference that just 99 cents can make in a business. So when we talk about increasing prices, again, we want to look at it in the framework of a few things. One, what are my loss leaders? Where am I willing to sacrifice margin? Two, are the products that I'm buying into, so most uh, core of my products meeting my INU target? And then three, where can I start building margin? Where can I start adding some increases in pricing? Where are the categories? Where are the vendors? What can I do to start building on some of that margin? And then of course, the other way is to negotiate some good deals so you get a better cost price, right? So maybe you're using vendor discounts. Maybe you're a part of an association that could help you negotiate some discounts. That's another way that we can improve our initial market. And so here is the formula for that initial markup formula, right? It's your markdown percentage, your expected markdown percentage, plus your operating expenses, plus your desired net profit, all divided by 100 plus your markdown percentage. So we'll send out this formula. It's a little bit, maybe if you're having trouble doing a quick calculation on it, we're certainly here to help. And there's a lot of factors that go into this, but the critical mistake number one that we want to address is it is okay to relook at your pricing and start growing your retail costs. It is okay, even if it's just 99 cents. Okay, critical mistake number two. Now, I know we heard a lot about markdowns and Jennifer put out there, what are some challenges you're facing? And this is, by and far and away, one of the biggest topics that we address with our retailers and just in the general community when we're out there giving these presentations, markdown, sale image, that is always the first question that we get. So here is the critical mistake number two. Stop viewing markdowns as your enemy. And whoever said, whoever gave the comment, my president didn't want a sale rack in my store, you have them call me and we will give them a full chat about why markdowns are a tool in your business, not an enemy. And really all comes down to the idea that stop valuing margin over cash. When you're not willing to take a markdown, what you are essentially saying, and I want to reframe this in your brain, you are basically saying, I care more about margin than I care about cash in my pocket because your inventory is cash. And if you are holding on to goods and they are sitting there and you are holding them and they are not selling, you are holding on to cash that you could be in your pocket and get reinvested and you're holding on to that for the sake of margin on a piece of paper. For the same thing, your accountant is going to pat you on the back and say, great margin this year, but that does not equate to cash in your pocket. So this is the bias that we're facing here, and it's called the sunk cost fallacy, okay? This is the bias we bring to the table when it comes to markdowns. And so here's a great little diagram. I think it's hilarious. It's two people sinking on a boat. We need to cut the dead weight or we'll sink. So the guy, other guy says, no, we spent a lot of money to buy that weight, right? It's like, I spent so much money on this product. I went to market. I believed in it. I sat there with my vendor. I wrote the order. We did a $10,000 investment into this new product line. If it's dragging your cash flow down, if it's dragging your business down, and you are more than halfway through a season, halfway through a year, and it is not selling, it is now dead weight in your business. Okay, one of the big things that's, of course, on everyone's mind, is there a recession coming that's going to hit us, right? Are we going to get hit by a recession? I want to stay conservative. I'm very nervous. Here's what I want to say and how it relates to markdown. There's two things. One, last year, at the same time frame, we were having this same exact conversation. The same exact conversation, right? 
a year ago, is the recession, a year from now, is there going to be a recession? And sure, has there been some difficulties in the economy? Have we experienced some highs and lows? Yes. But I would say, at least from the data we're seeing from our retailers and the general data we're seeing out of retail, retail has sustained, right? There's been some dips. There's been some soft months. We have not seen a general drop off in sales off a cliff in retail. It's holding fairly steady. So if a year ago we were worried about the recession and made decisions about our business based on a recession that didn't come to fruition, you would be dealing with missed opportunity and lost sales. So why is it any different right now? And Deloitte, which is a big fancy consulting firm, okay, one of their specialties is retail. They just came out with their 2023 report and the number one tool that is going to be most critical in the face of uncertainty in the economy is markdowns. It is markdown. And here is why. You can't plan your business for, you can't plan your business down off an event that you don't know if it, or if it will or will not occur. However, markdowns provide you with a lever to pull if business does go solid. Right? So markdowns are your lever in a crisis, in a uncertainty, in a downswing. Markdowns are the lever you can pull to get your cash out of the business. So we can't be afraid of markdowns. And we also can't be afraid to go and buy and really fulfill our potential. So the idea that we really love to impart on our customers is when it comes to markdowns, failing fast is the best strategy that you can apply to your business, okay? And the way that we look at it is like this. Markdowns are a cost of doing business. First of all, it creates demand for product that does not have demand, right? If something has been sitting on your floor and you've been watching customers pass by it, for a week after a week, the demand isn't there. Maybe it's the color. Maybe it's the fit. Maybe it was just a bad design, okay? But if it is getting passed over week after week, the demand for it is just not there. Markdowns allow you to create artificial demand for that product, okay? So markdowns are a tool that you can use to maneuver your customer. I don't want to say the word manipulate, but maybe a little, okay? And, you know, markdowns are not the boogeyman. We get really scared of them. Is my image going to be a sale business? Are people just going to come in searching for markdowns? No, a markdown rack with goods that have not sold, as long as they're taken in maintenance, as long as they're taken I'll tell you what creates the image of a sale business, okay? When you don't take markdowns and you get to the end of the season and you have to do a clearance sale because you have so much overage. That's what creates a sale image, not a rack of 30% off polos sitting on the side of the business that has 15 polos, 15 SKUs on it. That does not create a sale image. Clearance, store-wide promotions, continuous sale after sale, that's what creates sales images for stores. The other part is, and when we talk about margin, sacrificing margin over cash, right? When you take a markdown and you get that cash back in your pocket, it opens up for you to go out and purchase more efficient merchandise, right? It's like, when you go into your personal closet and you clear out some of the stuff that you've passed over now for two years, that sweater that's been sitting there, when you empty that stuff out of your closet, you make room for new, fresh merchandise to come in. And we can apply that to anything. Think about your refrigerator, right? When you have those old jars, think about the old jars of sauces and God knows what's in there in your fridge that have been sitting around that you don't touch, that you don't throw out, right? You're clogging up 
room that could go to fresh new produce. And that is how we need to think about markdowns, right? We're opening up our dollars to go invest in new, fresh merchandise that's going to excite the customer, not this old, stale goods that they've been walking by week after week. So markdowns are a tool to generate inventory help. They are not the enemy. They are actually a really valuable tool at your disposal. And there are some rules around markdowns. First of all, like we saw with the IMU, we need to plan for it, right? We need to plan for our markdowns. We need to have a set goal in mind that we want to take over the course of the next 12 months, right? Do we generally think that 20% is a good rate of markdown sales for our business? Is 15% more in line? It is crucial that we bake it into the formula of our business. And by the way, we should be taking markdowns to that 20 or 15%, whatever you feel is the right decision for your business, right? But I can guarantee if you are goaling for 20% markdowns and you've only done 10% of your sales and markdowns, there are old goods sitting on your floor that are not moving, right? None of us are immune to having to take a price decrease in our business. We're just not immune to it. There's no buyer out there, right? Take it, embrace it, use it as a tool. Super important. Your first markdown is your cheapest, okay? Here's another way you can get an image of being a sales store, right? You take that polo that hasn't sold in three months and you mark it down 10%. What's 10%? That's not a markdown. 10% is what I get when I give you my email at the front register. 10% is a happy birthday. Here's 10% off your purchase. 10% is not a markdown. So that polo will take 10% off, then we'll move it to 20, then we'll move it to 30, then we'll move it to 40. And that item has now circulated your store rack after rack from 10 to 20 to if something is not working and we need to create the demand, 30% is your starting point for markdowns, right? And listen, that's going to vary. 30%, they, there was a study done that people that walk into stores based on signage will not walk into a store for a sale or a markdown that's less than 40%. You're not stopping in your tracks and walking into a store for a 20% off sign. You want a deal. You want to create that demand. Figure out what your first markdown cadence is, but certainly 10, 15% does not a markdown that does not make. A markdown that does not make. Okay. Number four, learn from every markdown. When I was a buyer, my boss used to make me keep a notebook. And if I was marking product down, I would have to write, why did I mark this down? Was it the color? Was it the price? Was it the fit? Why did I mark down this item? You have to think about markdowns as tuition for understanding your markdown. A markdown is only an enemy. It's only an evil if you don't learn from it, right? If you go and you buy a bunch of hot pink polos for men and it doesn't sell, and then next season you bring in another big delivery of hot pink polos and it doesn't sell, that's when you've done a misservice in your buying of markdown items, right? You've bought into goods that you already have seen there wasn't demand for. So learning from each and every mistake we make is a good and healthy thing for our business, only if it prevents us from making future mistakes. Okay, number three, stop front-loading your merchandise. So this is really interesting. It actually happens to be really interesting right now because one of the things that we heard across the industry 
uh, really over the past year from our vendors was, if you don't place this order now, if you don't buy the goods with us now, it's, I'm not going to have any more available. There's going to be nothing in season. If you want to get your full deliveries, you have to place your order and you have to place it in full now. And that may have been true when there were supply chain issues. It's not so much true now. Deliveries have been leveling out. The supply chain issues have started to clear up. And we're seeing a little bit of a return to normalcy when it comes to receiving of product. So this is a little bit of the status quo bias. This is the bias we bring to the table. When we think about loading our merchandise. And what happens here is we think, well, in the past, I've always brought all my spring merchandise in February and all my fall merchandise in at the end of August. And that's how I've done things. And I bring it in and I let it ride for the season. And that's what I've done, right? It's worked for me. That's my business. Here is the challenge. Keeping your inventory fresh is probably one of the most important things in retail now. Customers are different shoppers than customers even five years ago. We are constantly being inundated online, on social media, by new, fresh, new product. I don't care if you are a woman buying fashion goods or a pet owner buying dog food. You are constantly inundated with newness and freshness, right? The last thing they want to see is walking into a retail store over the course of the season and seeing the same shirt on display in the front of the store seven times when they walk in, that's not new, that's not fresh, that's not exciting. And that lack of turnover and that lack of freshness is what stifles a lot of business with retailers across our client base. So we're gonna learn a lesson from the most successful boutique of all time, Zara. By far and away, the most successful boutique of all time. So I want to ask a question, and we're going to need a little audience participation, so if you could jump back in the chat. What do you think the average customer visit to a Zara is over the course of a year? How many times does a customer walk through the doors of a Zara over the course of a year? Okay, I see six, five, 20, 16, 10, three, 10. Who wrote 186? You have a shopping problem we need to talk about. 38, never heard of Zara, so no clue. Okay, for anyone who hasn't heard of Zara, it is the largest retailer in the global, in, across the globe. So 17, 17 is the number. They average 17 customer visitations over the course of the year. Okay, can anyone tell me what the average customer visit to an independent boutique is over the course of the year? Five, three, three, two. 10, five. It's 17 purchases that it's calculated by purchase. Okay. Three, three, three times a year in an average boutique, your customer is going to purchase something with you three times a year. What makes Zara so successful? And this is one of those lessons that it's not going to apply directly to your business. It's the mentality that we want to take away and what we can learn from the most successful on-paper retailer of all time. One, they never reorder. Never. It is a policy of theirs. There are no reorders. If you walk into their store and you want to buy something, they train their customer to buy it then and there because the next time you walk back in that store, it will most likely not be there. No recuts. So any of their vertical product they will not recut it. Again, they are training their customer, come back here often, 
and buy immediately or else it may be gone the next time you walk in. Their goods have a six-week shelf life. After six weeks, if it hasn't sold at full price, it either goes to the clearance in the back or they take it outside and shoot it in the head. It's done. Six-week shelf life. No more, no less. Six weeks is the time a SKU has and the style has to sell through their business. And then finally, they are constantly re-merchandising. So even if you walk back in the store within those six weeks, the jacket that's in front is now merchandised in the suiting department, shown with a suit instead of with shorts in the front in their resort section. They are masters at constantly re-merchandising. In fact, Banana Republic has a store in, in Fifth Avenue in Manhattan right next to Azara. And they couldn't understand why their customer visitation was so down compared to Zara's. One of the first thing that their big fancy consulting firm came in and found was Zara changes their windows once a week and Banana Republic changed it once a month. Someone walking by on the street every day that's walking to work back and forth, where do you think they're going to walk in? The place that's changing the windows and getting them excited about new merchandise weekly? Or the store that for the whole month has sat with that one dress in the window, that one shirt in the window. Constantly re-merchandising is an incredible way to get your customer looking at your merchandise as fresh, even if it fully isn't. And then how does this now actually practically impact your business? One of the things that we found is that 90% of sales come from merchandise that have been on your floor for 10 weeks or less. That across our retailers is the average number. It was actually 89%, but 90 looked better. 89%, 89 to 90% of your sales. It's coming from inventory that's landed within 10 weeks. And half of your business is coming from goods that landed within that same month. Okay. So when we talk about front-loading your merchandise and how it could be impacting your business, we want to start looking at how can we start parsing out deliveries over the course of month to month, right? How can we get some fresh goods so that people visiting your shop are seeing new deliveries, are seeing stuff that's re-merchandised, are seeing freshness in your assortment that they can get excited about not, hey, I walked back into the pro shop and saw the same polo that's been sitting there for eight weeks and for two months. It's the same shirt I've been seeing there. That's not exciting. And I don't care if you are selling to a man who you think doesn't care about fashion or selling to a pet owner who loves their dog. People are motivated by freshness, by newness, and by what is exciting to them. Okay, and the last, because I know we are running out of time. I can't believe I've spoken this much. I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions. So the last piece of critical mistake that you might be making in your retail business is stop winging it with your purchases. Inventory accounts for 52 to 55% of all your cash expenses in your business over the course of a year. It is the largest expense in every retail business. That's the largest expense. It's your inventory, okay? More than payroll, more than rent, inventory. Developing plans around how you're going to spend money on merchandise is so critical to the success of your business. And this is when we really get into two different concepts that we like to think about. Are you a buyer who is buying narrow and deep or are you a buyer that is buying wide and thin? Okay, so this is the last bias we'll talk about, the loss aversion bias. People are more inclined to avoid the pain from a loss that they are to experience the pleasure from a gain. So you would rather, as a person, all of us, would rather not get hurt by something 
that potentially win something. And this is how it applies to wide and thin versus narrow and deep, right? Narrow and deep means we have conviction in what we're buying. We stick to those convictions and we buy deep on the product we love because we have a plan to back it up, okay? We want to win big. We are investing big in our merchandise, in categories, in vendors, and we are taking risks. We're taking measured risks because we're looking at data, but we're taking risks. Wide and thin means I don't have a plan. I'm nervous about taking a loss. So I'm going to buy a bunch of things spread out across a bunch of areas and hope that it sells because I'm just going to throw a lot of stuff at my customer and hopefully they'll respond to something. I don't want to commit to anything too deeply. So I'll buy a size from here, a size from here, a size from here, a size from here, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then we get to a situation where you're a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. So here is what playing offense in retail looks like. First of all, you have aggressive plans to ensure you're landing the goods that you need. So we talked about those supply chain issues. When you commit to styles and vendors and categories that you believe in, you become more important to vendors, right? You get first priority because you have a big order. You don't have just a trinkle little order that is, is dribbling into them. You have a meaty business that you're starting to create with them that has value to them that they want to see succeed, right? It's when we start, how many vendors about should we have in a product category, right? And it's four, it's four. So if we're looking at belts, you should have about four max vendors in that category. If you have 20 vendors and you have one belt from each, that is wide and thin. Narrow and deep means I have two brands that I love and I believe in, and I buy deep into them, and that's what I present as my customer. This also helps you avoid excessive markdowns because think about it like this. If you buy a style fit and you buy one size run and you sell one, you're already almost sold out of the item, right? And then what happens is you're broken in sizing and you have to take a markdown. And then finally, it keeps your customer focused. Don't forget, you are the pro. You are the curator. You are the style icon, the expert, the pro. You are setting the trend. The deeper you buy into something and the more conviction you buy into it with, your customer will follow. And that is the difference between buying wide and thin and buying narrow and deep. And also, one last thing about this in terms of markdowns, if something doesn't work, you just wipe it away with a markdown, right? If you bought in deep in something and it doesn't work, you take that one specific area and you wipe it away with a markdown. If you buy wide and thin and you have spotty markdowns all over, you can't apply the same strategy. So I know we're nearing the end of the time. Let me just open this QR code here. Sorry. So here is the QR code. There were some slides at the end of the presentation that I think we're just not going to have time for, but I think we covered all the topics that we wanted to hit today. And so these are just some of the critical mistakes that we find we see retailers make. And really, oftentimes they're tied to just data biases that we have in our head as being business owners for a long time. And so we hope we're here to have a initial meeting with anyone, talk through some issues in your business, because sometimes just having that third party perspective can help you shift how you look at your own business and how you start to develop new goals and new methods for success. So we are so excited to be partners with AGM and we've been pretty long time partners now. I've been able to travel down and meet with some of you in person and I hope you got some value out of today. When it comes to the hierarchy of tools in your tool belt, Visual merchandising is at the top because you have customers that are built-in customers, right? They're walking into that shop, right? They're going to come in. They're going to check it out. What you present to them and how you present it to them and how fresh you keep it. So we want them to walk in, see new styles, see how you would put this together, right? Especially men, 
Sorry, like we need guidance on how to wear something, right? What do I wear this short with what shirt? How do I pair this together? What's this going to look like? What hat should I wear with this? I was just at a, at a store visit with actually a large golf retailer chain that we work with. And I walked in and it was so uninspiring. They just had a rack that was like 10 feet long with just polos. Polo. Okay. I do all polos on one rack. That's not exciting, right? That's not. Okay, so I can look through and find what I like, but instead, show me an outfit, show me a way. I'm just going to read Julie's. Narrow and deep seems to be a hard fit for a small private club because not everyone wants to be seen wearing the same item. What is your advice from this? My advice here is shift your perception of what narrow and deep mean. Narrow and deep doesn't mean that you just buy one style and buy so deep into it. It may mean you buy really deep into a certain vendor, right? So you're going to go deep into a vendor that you believe in. And so you could buy multiple styles from that vendor, but you're making a big statement on your floor with that vendor. It may be going narrow and deep in a product category. So if you want to talk about bringing, let's say, water bottles into your shop. That's going to be a big, all these hot new Camel and Stanley and Camelback and Stanley and Hydro Flask water bottles. If you bring in two dinky water bottles that are sitting on the shelf, that doesn't mean anything to anyone, right? So a new product category can mean, let's go deep into this. Let's give a big display. Let's come out of the gate with some chutzpah behind our buy. And then that is going narrow and deep. So it's not just about buying one style really deep. It's about really committing and buying something with conviction, whether it be a vendor, a style, or a product category. Awesome. Thank you so much for being in today to share your valuable insights on how to avoid critical mistakes, your experience, and expertise. I've been a missing office for our members. And so with that, thank you again for joining us today, everyone. Thank you, everyone.